Hello and welcome. This is AQA GCSE Chemistry. The unit is called Energy Changes. And this, along with the other four whole unit videos that I've published on here, is good for revision for paper one. This video is for triple science. The combined science video is available on the channel. Remember, timestamps in the description below. But for now, let's get going with exothermic and endothermic reactions. Exothermic and endothermic reactions. Reactions can transfer energy to the surroundings. Imagine we have some reactants with 100 joules of energy in their bonds. We produce some products which have 70 joules of energy in their bonds. 30 joules of energy have been transferred to the surroundings. This is an exothermic reaction. For exothermic reactions, these transfer energy to the surroundings. So imagine we have a reaction going on in a flask. If it was an exothermic reaction, we would detect a temperature rise as shown by the thermometer there. Examples of exothermic reaction include combustion reactions, which is the same thing as burning. Many oxidation reactions are exothermic. In fact, combustion is an oxidation reaction. And neutralization reactions are exothermic. For example, acid with alkali or acid with base. These types of reactions are used in self-heating cans and hand warmers, for example. In terms of our self-heating can, here's a small diagram to show the idea of that. We've got some self-heating soup. There's a little button at the bottom of the can. If we look inside, we can see that when we press the button, we pierce a little membrane, which causes two chemicals to mix and causes an exothermic reaction, which heats our soup. Endothermic reactions. We would detect a temperature drop. That's because these take in energy from the surroundings. Examples include thermal decomposition and, a very specific example, the reaction of citric acid with sodium hydrogen carbonate. These type of reactions are often used in sports injury packs, for example, to reduce or stop swelling of an injury. Activation energy. Reactions happen when reacting particles collide with enough energy. Here is a flask with a reaction going on. And I've just shown two of the reacting particles in that flask. If they don't react with enough energy, there will not be a chemical reaction. However, in the second example here, they have reacted with enough energy, so there is a chemical reaction between those particles. The minimum energy needed for particles to react is called the activation energy. Reaction profiles. Here's a reaction profile showing the energy on the y-axis and the progress of the reaction on the x-axis. For our reactants, we can see the energy level there. However, the energy in the products is a bit lower. And we can show the activation energy on this reaction as well. The activation energy is the difference between the reactant line and the peak of that hump there. So there's our activation energy. We also need to know what's called the overall energy change and that's shown by the reactant line and the products line. You should recognize a reaction profile and you should be able to label those two parts on a reaction profile graph. For exothermic reactions, I've just repeated the diagram again there, but this time just to show that energy is transferred to the surroundings in an exothermic reaction. And that's what the reaction profile will look like for an exothermic reaction. For an endothermic reaction, we have the products energy line is higher than the energy of the reactants and in this case the energy has been taken in from the surroundings. Also worth labeling the parts here so the activation energy x is shown by that line there and the overall energy change is shown by y between the reactants and the products there. The energy change of reactants this is for the higher tier only. The energy change of reactions Let's take an example of the reaction of hydrogen with oxygen to form water. This is a balanced formula equation for that reaction. We can see that there's two molecules of hydrogen that react with one molecule of oxygen to produce two molecules of water. To understand what's going on here, we need to remember that energy is supplied to break the bonds in the molecules of hydrogen and oxygen, and energy is released when making bonds to produce the water molecules. The overall energy change is the energy supplied to break bonds 
minus the energy released when making bonds. So let's take a look at what's called a display formula for this reaction. We have a hydrogen molecule there as shown by H with a single line between the two. And in the reaction you can see we actually have two of those, so we put a two in front of the formula there. We react that with one molecule of oxygen. There's a double bond between the atoms in oxygen. And that produces two molecules of water. We can see all the various different bonds that are involved in this reaction. Here is the energy in the bonds in kilojoules per mole. So for the bond between the hydrogen atoms, that's 436 kilojoules per mole. For the double bond between the oxygen atoms, it's 498. And for the bond between hydrogen and oxygen, in the water, it's 464. So, we can see there's 436 joules between the hydrogen atoms. There's two of those, so we put a two in front there. There's 498 joules in the double bond between the oxygen atoms. And for each of our OH bonds in the water, there's 464 kilojoules per mole. We can use this to calculate the overall energy change. So, breaking bonds in the reactants, that's the energy supplied. Well, we have two times 436 plus 498, that gives us 1370. And in terms of making bonds in the product, that's the energy release. We have 2 times 464 in each water molecule. But remember, there's two molecules of water in the balanced reaction. So that gives us a total of 1856 kilojoules per mole. To calculate the overall energy change, it's the energy supplied minus energy released. That gives us the overall energy change of 1370 minus 1856, which is minus 486 kilojoules per mole. This actually tells us that this is an exothermic reaction because more energy is released when making bonds than absorbed to break bonds. Let's take a look at one more example. This is the reaction of methane with chlorine. And again, we're going to show the display formula. And there it is. And the bond energies in kilojoules per mole are shown by this table. If you want to give this one a go, please pause here and give it a try. But if not, we'll go through the answers in a moment. So, in terms of breaking bonds in the reactants, that's the energy supplied. We have bonds in CH4, and there's four CH bonds there, as shown by the CH in the table. And there's our four bonds. So that gives us 4 times 413, which is 1652. We then have one Cl to Cl bond, as shown in the table there and shown in the reaction there. So that gives us 243. And that's a total of 1895 kilojoules per mole. In terms of making bonds in the products, that's the energy released. We have 3 C to H bonds, as we can see there. 1, 2, 3. That gives us 1, 2, 3, 9. Then we have 1 C to Cl bond, as shown there. That gives us 3, 2, 7. And we have 1 H to Cl bond, which gives us that product there. And that's 432. So if we add those together, we get 1998 kilojoules per mole. And again, energy supplied minus energy released gives us minus 103 kilojoules per mole. Again, this is exothermic because more energy is released when making bonds than absorbed to break bonds. So, in summary, for exothermic reactions, when the overall energy change is negative, for example, minus 103 kilojoules per mole, the reaction is exothermic. And here is the reaction profile for an exothermic reaction. If we have an endothermic reaction, when the overall energy change is positive, for example, 178 kilojoules per mole, the reaction is endothermic. And here's our reaction profile for an endothermic reaction. So that's it, energy change of reactions. Do go over this again if you need to, but for now, we move on to chemical cells and fuel cells. This is for triple science only. Cells and batteries. Here we're talking about cells in terms of providing electricity. Cells have chemicals that react to produce electricity. Here is a simple cell. Looks very much like electrolysis, but remember this is not electrolysis. We don't have a power supply as we do in electrolysis. But we do have metal electrodes and we have an electrolyte. This contains ions that are able to move. 
This will produce a voltage between the metals as long as one metal is more reactive than the other. The voltage produced depends on the types of electrode that you use, the electrolyte used, the concentration of electrolyte and the temperature of the reaction. When we're talking about types of electrode, the bigger the difference in reactivity, the bigger the voltage. So here is part of the reactivity series of metals, most reactive at the top and least reactive at the bottom. And based on our rule, the biggest voltage will be produced between magnesium and copper. Also important to note that if we label this electrode number one and this one number two, if metal two is less reactive, the voltage will be positive. For example, if metal one was zinc and metal two was copper, we'd have a voltage, for example, of plus 1.1 volts. If metal one is less reactive, the voltage will be negative. For example, if metal one was copper and metal two was iron. An example of a voltage here would be minus 0 0.78 volts. However, cells can be sealed, made to last a long time and made to be safe. Here is a cell that we use in everyday life. It's a 1.5 volt cell. A battery is two or more of these cells joined in series. In other words, joined in line with each other. This gives a higher voltage. So 1.5 plus 1.5 equals 3 volts. You may remember this from GCSE physics. Alkaline cells, a couple of details we need to know about those. The chemical reactions stop in alkaline cells when the chemicals run out. Alkaline cells are non-rechargeable. For rechargeable cells, the chemical reactions produce an electrical current, like so, lighting up that lamp. However, the chemical reactions are reversed when a current is supplied. So here we go, we've got a power supply. We reverse the chemical reactions, so we go back to our start chemicals to produce more electricity. This applies to home use cells and also to large batteries in vehicles such as cars and buses and trucks. The next and final section is about fuel cells. Hydrogen fuel cells oxidize hydrogen to produce electricity. The overall reaction is hydrogen plus oxygen gives water. This is a balanced formula equation for that reaction and I've seen this asked one or two times on past papers. Here is a simple diagram of a fuel cell. The idea is to supply hydrogen and oxygen. We have a waste product of water. Any hydrogen that is not reacted is recycled so that none of it is wasted. Here we have two electrodes and we can look at the half equations at the electrodes. Here is electrode number one and the half equation there is hydrogen breaks down to form two hydrogen ions and two electrons. It's these electrons that actually cause the current or produce the current. So they're produced in electrode number one they flow around the circuit, power a device, and move to the other electrode, which is electrode number two. At electrode number two, we have oxygen, which reacts with the hydrogen ions and the electrons that are formed at electrode number one to produce water. So you need to know and remember that half equation for electrode number two. A common type of question in exams is to evaluate hydrogen fuel cells versus rechargeable cells. So let's take a look at that. Vehicles running on hydrogen fuel cells versus those running on rechargeable batteries. Let's take a look at advantages and disadvantages of hydrogen fuel cell vehicles. Advantages are that they are faster to refuel. You only need to put more hydrogen in to get them uh, running again. Vehicles travel further before refueling for hydrogen fuel cells and there's no toxic chemicals released after you dispose of the hydrogen fuel cell. The disadvantages are that hydrogen comes from fossil fuels and fossil fuels are non-renewable. Hydrogen is difficult to store and is explosive. It's a gas so you have to compress it by quite a lot to be able to make it storable in cars. And finally, there are not that many hydrogen refueling stations available as yet. So that's a disadvantage of using a vehicle run on hydrogen fuel cells. So that's it, a summary of cells and batteries and fuel cells as part of the triple science content for this unit. And that's the final unit for AQA GCSE Chemistry Paper 1. 
Thank you for watching and I'll see you soon.